Everyone, welcome back to the CompTIA Network Plus course. Table 12 tree wireless antenna types and ranges. Model gain indoor range at 1 megabits per second, indoor range at 11, mits, 11 megabits per second, outdoor range 2 megabits per second, outdoor range at 11 megabits per second, air ANT 2410YR. 10 decibel 800 feet 230 feet not specified not specified air ant 1728 5.2 decibel 497 feet 142 feet not specified not specified air air ant 49412.2 decibel 350 feet 350 feet, not specified, not specified. Air ANT 2506, 5.2 decibel, not specified, net, not specified. 5,000 feet, 1,580 feet. Air ANT 241212 decibel, not specified, not specified. 24,288 feet, 7,000. 392 feet. It's pretty much a given that antennas operating with frequencies below 1 gigahertz are measured in decibel, while those operating above 1 gigahertz are measured in decibel. But because this rule doesn't always work definitely, sometimes we have to compare the strength of one antenna measured in decibel with another measured. In numerically equivalent DBI in order to determine which one is stronger. This is exactly why it's important to know that a particular numerical magnitude of DBD is more powerful than the same um, numerical magnitude of DBI. I know this sounds pretty complicated but because the relationship between these two values is linear it really makes the conversion a lot easier than you might think. Here's how it works. At the same frequency, a dipole antenna has about 2.2 decibel gain over a 0 dBi theoretical isotropic antenna, which means you can easily convert from dBd to dBi by adding 2.2 to the dBd rating. Conversely, subtract 2.2 from the DBI rating and you get the equivalent DBD rating. Armed with that you've learned about the difference between Omni and Yagi antennas and the difference between DBD and DBI gain ratings. You should be able to compare the relative range of transmission of one antenna with respect to another based on a combination of these characteristics. For example, the following four antenna ratings are given in relative order for greatest to least range. 7 dBi Yagi equivalent to uh, 9.2 dBi Yagi. 7 dBi Yagi longer range than 7 dBi Omni. 4.8 dBd Omni equivalent to uh, 7 dBi Omni. <coughs> 4.8 dBi Omni equivalent to a 2.6 dBd Omni. So now that you understand the basic components involved in a wireless network, it's time to use what you've learned about these standards we use in our everyday home and corporate wireless networks and the different ways they're actually installed. Installing a wireless network. Let's say you just bought a wireless access point for your laptop to use to connect to the internet. What's next? Well, that all depends on the type of installation you want to create with your new toys. First, it's important to understand where to place the access point. For, for example, you don't want to place the access point on or near a metal filing cabinet or other obstructions. Once you decide on the access points placement, you can configure your wireless network. 
there are two main installation types ad hoc and infrastructure mode and each 802 11 wireless network device can be installed in one of these two modes also called service sets ad hoc mode independent basic service set this is the easiest way to install wireless 802.11 devices in this mode the wireless network interface cards or other devices can communicate directly without the need for an access point a good example of this is two laptops with wireless network cards installed if both cards were set up to operate in ad hoc mode they would connect and transfer files as long as the other network settings like protocols were set up to enable this as well We'll also call this an independent basic service set, IBSS, which is created as soon as two wireless devices communicate. To set up a basic ad hoc wireless network, all you need are two wireless network interface cards and two computers. First, assuming they're built in, install the cards into the computers according to the manufacturer's directions. During the software installation, you will be asked if you want to set up the network interface in ad hoc mode or infrastructure mode. For an ad hoc network, you would obviously go with the ad hoc mode. Once that's done, all you've got to do is bring the computers within range 90 to 100 millimeters of each other. They'll see each other being able to connect to each other. Figure 12, 10 shows an example of an ad hoc network. Notice the absence of an access point. An ad hoc network would not scale well and really is not recommended due to collision and organization issues. With the low cost of access points, this type of network is just not needed today. Infrastructure mode basic service set. The most common use of wireless networking equipment is to give us the wireless equivalent of a wired network. To do this, all 802.11 wireless equipment has the ability to operate in what's known as infrastructure mode, also referred to as a basic service set, which is provided by an access point. The term basic service area BSA is also used at times to define the area managed by the access point but BSS is the most common term used to define the cell area in infrastructure mode. Network interface cards communicate only with an access point instead of directly with each other as they do when they're in ad hoc mode. All communication between hosts plus and with any wired portion of the network must go through the access point. A really important fact to remember is that in this mode, wireless clients actually appear to the rest of the network as though they were standard wired hosts. Figure 1211 shows a typical infrastructure mode wireless network. Pay special attention to the access point and the fact that it's also connected to the wired network. This connection from the access point to the wired network is called the distribution system DS and is referred to as wireless bridging. When you configure a client to operate in a wireless infrastructure mode, you need to understand a couple of basic wireless concepts namely SSID and security. This the service set identifier SSID refers to the unique 32 character identifier that represents a particular wireless network and defines the basic service set. Oh and by the way a lot of people use the terms SSID and BSS interchangeably so don't let that confuse you. All devices involved in particular wireless network must be configured with the same SSID. Good to know is that if you set all your access points to the same SSID, mobile wireless clients can roam around freely within the same network. Doing this creates an extended service set ESS and 
provides more coverage than a single access point. Figure 1212 shows two access points configured with the same SSID in an office, thereby creating an ESS network. So here we just have uh, figure 12.2, I suppose this will be our server network backbone and your wireless cell, and that's operating channel 6. Sorry, this is operating on channel 1, and that's operating on channel 6. And here's just how an access point works. Here's your server, router, internet, switch, and here's the access point, which is physically connected to the switch here. For users to be able to roam throughout the wireless network from access point to access point without losing their connection to the network, all access point signal areas must overlap by 10% of their signal or more. To make this happen, be sure the channels on each access point are set differently. I remember in an 802.11bg network. There are only three non-overlapping channels, 1, 6 and 11. So careful design is super important here. Wireless controllers. You'll be hard pressed to find an enterprise wireless LAN that doesn't use wireless controllers. In fact, every wireless enterprise manufacturer has a controller to manage the access points in the network. By looking at figure 12.3, you can see the difference between what we call standalone access points and controller solution. In a standalone solution, all the access points have a full operating system loaded and running, and each must be managed separately. In the controller based system, the access points are what we refer to as lightweight, meaning they do not have a full operating system running on them. The controller and access point split duties a solution known as split MAC. Access points running with a controller are referred to as lightweight, but you'll also hear the term thin access point, whereas you'll hear the term thick referring to the access points that run a full OS or operating system. Take another look at figure 12, 13. You can see that the administrator isn't managing each access point independently. When using the wireless LAN controller solution instead, the administrator configures the controller which in turn pushes out the configuration needed for each access point. Controllers allow us to design and implement larger enterprise wireless networks in less time and tedium. tedium which is very important in today's world. One feature that also gives controllers the ability to provide a great solution is when you're dealing with a location that's overloaded with clients because it utilizes VLAN pooling or virtual LAN pooling. This is very cool because it allows you to partition a single large wireless network broadcast domain into multiple VLANs and then either statically or randomly assign clients into a pool of VLANs. So all clients get to keep the same SSID and stay connected to the wireless network, even though they roam, they're just different broadcast domains. So here we have figure 12.3, and you see here we have standalone and controller-based wireless networks. So here's a standalone, a controlled access point and here we have the controller based state solution. In order for a split map to work in a wireless controller network, the access points and controller run a protocol to enable them to communicate. The preparatory protocol that Cisco used was called Lightweight Access Protocol LWAAP and is pictured in figure 12. 14. Keep in mind that LWAPP isn't used too much these days, but a newer, more secure protocol called Control and Provisioning of Wireless Access Points, CAPWAP, 
which also happens to be non proprietary has replaced it to become the standard that most controller manufacturers use today. So I'm going to leave it here today for this video. If you like listening, please consider like, sharing and subscribing. Thank you.